But every now and then comes a show that every single anime fan takes a look at and says, Hey, that's pretty good. If you dare and call these shows anything but great, then you will be hit with a rage of 1 million weebs harder than when I hit your mom's ass last night. These shows include stuff like Death Note, Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, Steins Gate, Rent a Girlfriend, and I hereby petition to add this year's summertime rendering to this list. <laughs> If you never heard of Summertime Rendering, it's okay, since it unfortunately got picked up by this underground streaming service you probably never heard of, Disney+. Plus. And it's unfortunate, since I truly believe more people should watch this anime, because quite honestly, it's pretty much perfect. The premise of the show is that the main character Shinpei comes back to his hometown to attend the funeral of his childhood friend Ushio, who died by drowning. Upon coming back, he finds out that the circumstances around Ushio's death are sus as heck, so he starts to investigate them. And after investigating upon them further, he finds out about the existence of these shadows. They are these creatures that copy the looks and memories of humans, kill them and take their place. Shinpei himself also finds out that he has this mysterious power to return to a certain checkpoint every time he dies. <coughs> You can probably already tell the general vibe of the show just from hearing the premise. It is filled with this thick air of mystery and intrigue. The characters are constantly plagued by paranoia since they don't know who they can trust or if they can trust themselves to bring other people in on the secret. Couple that with the fact that the whole premise of the show is set on a remote island and suddenly you're hit with this huge feeling of isolation. The show absorbs you and makes you feel like you're trapped with these creatures and you don't know their goals, their motivations, their weaknesses. The only thing you know that they are hostile and out for your blood and you don't have anywhere to hide. <laughs> the whole vibe of the show is helped immensely by sound design. Honestly, I honestly don't remember when was the last time sound design in anime made me feel so creeped out like this. To be specific, both sound design and directing play into this. The pacing itself is perfect throughout. There will be these scenes where you would just see the landscape with cicadas sounding off in the distance and you would just know something was out of place. There's even a moment in early episodes where I literally got jump scared. When was the last time you got jump scared by an anime? Like there's so many details hidden in sound design for this anime. There are even auditory cues for when Shinpei uses his powers. <clears throat> Similar to this other obscure show you may know. Of course, you can't talk about sound design without mentioning music. Now, the soundtrack for the show is perfectly fine. Each track helps accentuate the scene it's following, but a lot of times you'll find that silence is the best mood setter here. The openings and endings are also perfectly integrated into the vibe of the show, especially the first ending. The sheer feeling of isolation and mystery you get from it is just insane. Having a shot of a real island filmed from afar, all this eerie music plays in the background, just, cr just, just makes you feel like you're on that island and that there is a mystery that you just have to sorrow or you'll die. The first opening also does this really well. But as is tradition with anime, midway through, they decide to switch to new openings and endings. These new ones are way more action-y and hype than the last ones, but that kind of works for the show, since the show itself also changes genres at that point. At about midway point, most of the mystery gets revealed to the characters. But don't worry, there are still more plot twists to come in the later half. Because of that, the show switches to this action-y cat and mouse type of thing between heroes and villains. And that is all thanks to the time travel aspect, which is one of my favorite implementations of time travel in a story, like, ever. The reason why it works so well is because it sets up the roles both for time travel and shadows themselves, and then follows them. And then similar to Death Note, it allows both heroes and villains to outwit each other and do these big brain plays, not by breaking the roles, but by following them and using them in creative ways. And that's why all the outplays work and you believe them and they don't just feel like they come out of nowhere and they're just breaking the roles of the world. There are limits to both the shadow's capabilities and Shinpei's abilities. Neither side can just spam their OP hacks, but they can both recharge them, and that allows both sides to be victorious at different points. And man, do some of those battles get me closer to a heart attack faster than when I eat that Big Mac. The thing is also the whole story is followed by some gorgeous animation. I already touched on the great directing that's present in the show, but most of it is used for creative angles and framing for the shots of Mio's panties. Yeah, shots. Like, plural. 
The animation throughout is consistent and even better, consistently great, and the art style gives the whole show this awesome visual identity. The manga this show is based off has a unique art style and I think Studio OLM managed to expertly translate it to animation without losing the creepy factor in it. But the manga has uncensored waifu titties, 0 out of 10, worst adaptation ever. Speaking of waifus, this show has quite a bit to choose from. There's pretty much something for everyone here. We have big titty waifus, blonde waifus, panty waifus, 300 year old chill. Hey yo, who the fuck messed with my script? But in all seriousness, the characters in this show are amazing. They all have distinct personalities, from the main cast all the way to random people on the street. But since we're on this topic, let me just rank the best girls in the show real quick. Hizuru, Naked Hizuru, Ushio, Fake Ushio, New Fake Ushio, Mio, Fake Mio, Haine, 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 not this Haine though. This MILF, Shimpe with his hair down, these ends, and then this chick, cause f*** her. As you can see, there are a lot of great characters in the show, and if you told me any one of them is your favorite, I wouldn't even fight you on it. Except for her, she sucks, I hate her, you should hate her as well. The MC himself is also not built like the others. Shippe's whole thing is that he always tries to keep a level head and choose the best course of action depending on the situation. He actually uses his brain and comes to logical conclusions. Except when he had to figure out that he can use return by death, but <clears throat> we'll let that one slide. But what makes him really interesting is that he fails like a bunch of times and he has to go through this trial and error to try and find the best outcome for everyone but even then there are some things and some people he just can't save but he grows because of it and finds his motivations and that applies to all the characters yes even her they all change their motivations and worldviews based on what happened and what timeline they're in and in contrast to them you have these villains. They themselves don't want to change and only start to after Shinpei and his harem start to throw a wrench in their plans. Both heroes and villains start to adapt themselves based on what the other side does. I don't want to talk about the villains too much because then I would have to go into spoiler territories but just know that they are great. Their motivations may seem surface level at first but the more you think about them the more you'll find that they are way deeper and way more interesting than you think. And again, I have to mention, both heroes and villains start having these amazing cat and mouse games with their powers and time travels where they try to catch each other off guard while going through the timelines and basically beat or kill the other side. And that's what makes this show so watchable. It doesn't blast you with these deep philosophical questions, but it still gives them and allows you to think about them yourself. Questions like, is your clone their own person? What are the sacrifices that have to be made for immortality? Why isn't the Rent-A-Girlfriend manga finished yet? And so on. And that's the great thing about the show. You can just casually watch it and like it, or allow yourself to be completely absorbed into this world and characters and end up completely loving it. The show is interesting throughout. Like there are some stuff that happens in episode 15 that have relevance in like episode 24. This is a nicely thought of and written story, which was adapted with care into an arguably perfect adaptation. Okay, you might be saying, but animatic, you like isekai, what gives you the right to say this is peak anime? Okay, first off, eat my 2.5 inch. And secondly, there is something for everybody here, and that something is executed perfectly and works so well with everything else in the show. It basically just all meshes so perfectly together. I really can't recommend this show enough and I applaud you to try and watch it even if you have to make a blood contract with a little demon mouse. No wait, I take everything back, there is no cucking scene, 0 out of 10, worst anime ever. 